Good evening, and thank you for joining us as we mark International Women's Day with an important event on gender and genocide. My name is Arnesa Bolushmich Kustura, and tonight I'm joined by three distinguished speakers who will join me in a conversation on women's issues related to the Bosnian genocide, as well as how the women of Bosnia fared post-conflict and post dayton and how are they faring now? Um, towards the end of the event, we will allow about 20 minutes for any questions from the audience. So please um, pay attention to our speakers and ensure that you do get your questions in towards the end. I'd like to take a moment to welcome our distinguished guest speakers tonight and to thank them for joining me for this important and what I'm certain will be a very insightful conversation. Aida Hozic is an Associate Professor of International Relations and Associate Chair of Political Science at the University of Florida in the United States. Her key areas of research interest are feminist political economy, culture and global politics, and conflict and post-conflict studies. Aida, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Ernesa. It's wonderful to be here. Just wonderful. Thank you. Riada Asimovic Akyol is a Bosnian journalist based in Washington, DC. She is also the creator and host of the audio and video podcast, Dignified Resilience. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, The Atlantic, Foreign Policy, Al Jazeera, New Lines, Al Monitor, and The Nation. As a storyteller, opinion writer, and public speaker, she focuses on politics, religion, and gender, and has been a vehement supporter of efforts for raising awareness about the Bosnian genocide. Riada, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much to you and remembering uh, Srebrenica for organizing this uh, event. Thank you. Amra Panjo is a lecturer and human rights activist based in Sarajevo, who has over 20 years of experience in peace building and post-conflict resolutions. She is the founder of Small Steps, an NGO that promotes inter-ethnic and inter-faith peace and non-violence, as well as gender equality within Bosnia. Um, in a TPO Foundation poll, she was actually voted as one of the 11 most influential women who built peace in post-war Bosnia. Currently, she is a doctoral candidate in the College of Political Sciences at the University of Sarajevo, focusing on peacebuilding methodology in security and defense. Amra, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Thank you, thank you, I'm happy to be with you. Thank you all. Um, as some members in our audience may know, the genocide in uh, Bosnia took a lot of lives. Um, however, when it is discussed, um, unfortunately, there is a clear division in how we, we talk about the genocide and the experiences, particularly of women. Um, it is well known that the the estimates are that between 20,000 to 50,000 women in Bosnia were victims of wartime rape. And in, it is in fact the genocide and the war in Bosnia that actually led to legislation um, that allowed for rape to be uh, admitted as a, a crime against humanity and uh, this horrible atrocity, which it really is. However, that was 25 years ago. Since then, the Bosnian women have tried to obviously rebuild their lives, um, as we have seen with the mothers of Srebrenica, who have focused all of their strength, all of their time and all of their efforts in ensuring justice prevails over hatred, over injustice and over violence. We've also seen a great deal of Bosnian women speak out about the inequality they, that is facing them currently, as well as the inequality in the discussion of genocide. So my first question is actually going to be really directed at all three members, three speakers. Uh, women are often considered the silent victims of war. And their experience are very often 
little discussed. Uh, the gender genocide of Bosnia's women, as I mentioned, paved that way for international attention and legislation too. What do you think is missing when we discuss women and genocide or women's status in conflict zones? Um, and Riada, I'm gonna start with you. Thank you so much, Ernesta. Hello, everyone, again, and just uh, to uh, say hello to esteemed guests as well, organizers, and those in the audience. Uh, just shortly, I am honored to be invited, and uh, I want to express my gratitude for all the efforts that Remembering Srebrenica as an institution does tirelessly on all kinds of important efforts to raise awareness on Bosnian genocide. And uh, I appreciate all the events, and I learned, and I uh, share, uh, I think that it's very important that we keep listening to survivors, experts, allies on a variety of pertinent topics. So I'm thankful for this opportunity to contribute a few thoughts to this conversation today that I really care about um, and that I've tried to shed light to through international media and audience channels within my reach and beyond just Bosnian context. That means, and uh, as Arnesa asked, allow me to just mention some general specifics maybe about the state of the world as we speak of genocide and gender before we turn to Bosnia, um, but obviously related to it. Um, Surely this is not an easy topic by any means, but ignoring the conversations about it um, or not mentioning it enough is absolutely more harmful uh, than um, beneficial to many of those involved. I want to not forget saying that though our conversation or focus of conversation might be on women today. Many men around the world, including in Bosnia and Herzegovina, have also experienced sexual violence uh, during the war. And conversation on masculinity and genocide is a whole thing of its own, I suppose. Uh, but in general, if we speak about um, sexual violence during conflict, allow me to mention a book that's recently been published, uh, Our Bodies, Their Battlefield by Christina Lamb, who is award-winning war reporter. And she wrote kind of the first major account to address the scale of rape and sexual violence in modern conflict. And what was striking to me is that she also said that in the last few years, she has just seen much more horrific brutality against women than she had seen in all of the previous years and decades of her reporting. So um, things are not getting better, uh, unfortunately, or not as much as we would think in 2021, considering that we have examples from Spanish Civil War from 1936 to 39, when rape was used systematically to spread terror. And then some other examples from this particular book, but in general, you know, we have comfort women that were enslaved uh, by the Japanese during World War II. Then we have Bangladesh, 1971. We have Argentina under military junta in, you know, in late 70s, late 70s. Then Rwanda, of course, Rohingya in Myanmar in 2017. Girls and women in Nigeria uh, kidnapped by Boko Haram. The Yazidi women uh, and children who witnessed the mass murder of their families before being enslaved by ISIS. And then cases from Colombia, Central African Republic. I'm just trying to show how geographically dispersed yet pervasive uh, this, uh, this crime is. And of course, uh, Bosnian genocide that we will focus on today. I must, of course, and not forget the Uyghurs. Uh, we have a very new, uh, and though not first, uh, but freshly published report um, by New Lines Institute here in DC, uh, published just yesterday, I believe, that clearly shows how outside of the concentration camps or the so-called education camps, Uyghur women are subjected to systematic forms of sexual violence causing a lot of bodily and mental harm. And they are subjected to sexual violence through coercive birth prevention procedures, forced sterilization, IUD placements, abortions, and all sorts of unknown injections or medications that's stopping them, their menstrual cycles as documented further under several sections below covering um, articles of special campaigns to control birth control violations. So this is happening. This, there is significant public evidence. That's why I'm mentioning it based on all sorts of government statistics. And that's the thing. We can no longer say, oh, we did not know. Oh, that's one of the things with internet or social media, or that we know what's going on right now. Um, and as we speak about the past and the consequences of Bosnian genocide uh, and specifically sexual violence, I think it's important that we acknowledge 
and speak up against this horrific uh, sexual violence that's going on at this moment. And related to that, the United Nations estimates that for every one rape reported in the connection with a, with a conflict, a further 10 to 20 cases goes undocumented. And you can imagine how difficult, of course, it is to even get this sort of statistics, but it just shows how brutally pervasive it is. And if you think about why is this happening so much, um, well, as... Christina Lamb wrote in that book, but it's kind of so clear because it's so cheap, uh, because rape is the cheapest weapon known to man. Um, and it's very effective in, in terms of brutal uh, harm and torture and dehumanization and the long term consequences that it that it brings. So um, if we speak about Bosnia, and I'm sure Aida uh, and Amra will tell us more, and we will continue sp speaking about specificities. I think a lot of us know, but to mention for uh, everybody in the audience that rape was perpetuated systematically. That means that while some perpetrators acted on their own, uh, this was an organized and planned and deliberate um, initiative and, um, and organization. We know from different reports how it was particularly sadistic um, to, in ways to inflict uh, maximum humiliation on the victims. And of course, the thing that, um, that is very important to, to mention is that the sexual violence in Bosnia and Herzegovina was both gendered and ethnicized. Uh, and we've we have a lot of um, experts and scholars who've written about it, and I'm looking forward, of course, to hear Aida's uh, you know inputs on this. But we know why and how women, and especially raped women, in this context represented body of a nation, uh, with everything that that entailed uh, in terms of ethno-national ideologies and what bod women's body served for as a metaphor for homeland that both needs to be defeated or protected. Um, in terms of international justice following genocide, yes, Ernesta, you, you mentioned, um, I mean, though rape was formalized as international war crime in 1919, the International Criminal Court has convicted no one. Um, so the, we know that in Nuremberg trials, of course, there were no rape victims' testimonies, uh, that International uh, Criminal Tribunal for the Former Yugoslavia did convict perpetrators of rape as a form of torture and sexual enslavement as a crime against humanity, but fail to indict rape as an act of genocide. So we're not there yet, though of course, um, this was a really uh, important milestone and thanks to ICTY. Uh, that means that then local courts in countries that are affected with it deal with it. Um, I read that a couple of days ago um, that um, after nearly two years in the parliament, the Yazidi women survivors law was passed just a few weeks ago, for example, in Iraq. And then we have specific things that go on in Rwanda. In our case, in Bosnia as well, we have a lot of local courts um, that are trying to deal with this work. But... Um, like for everything else, it takes political will. And like for so many things in our own country, that lacks um, in, in, many, in many occasions, including this one, complicating things both for survivors. And before, I guess, uh, other uh, speakers, um, before we continue this conversation, I would just like to say, um, why does this matter? Why are we here talking about this today? Um, considering that Bosnian genocide targeted both men and women, right? All were targeted because of what these people who were murdered represented to their murderers. All were to be extinguished, if we speak particularly here about uh, Bosniaks, Bosnian Muslims. But I have noticed conversations in general, not just within Bosnian context, but pertinent. And I thought it was, um, I guess, expected, but interesting to talk about in voice uh, sometimes questions like but why do we need to study women's experience like how much do these differences matter is this going to diminish experience whether it's holocaust whether it's different um different genocides and i believe that it is very important to speak about women's experiences that it's not gonna and it doesn't diminish uh, all the harm that has been done to men as well, but it can only allow us to get a more holistic understanding of what has happened. So I only hope that conversations like this and um, other works and accounts uh, will keep coming in terms of women's 
testimonies as storytellers, right? Um, as themselves. This is a process that's been going on and that's continuing for other atrocities. So uh, we shouldn't berate ourselves as much, but we should be vigilant about how much there is to do because uh, there is still so little punishment, so much amnesty very often. Perpetrators walk around freely and this lack of accountability facilitates easier repetition of the crimes, um, in my opinion. So I have a lot more to say about why we need to talk about in terms of the changes that you also mentioned, Arnesa, and um, I think that we can get to all of this um, in, in a bit, but um, these conversations in terms of both what needs to be done, um, I look forward to, to talking about all this um, as well today. Thank you so much uh, for that really insightful uh, answer, Riada. It's very much appreciated. Um, Aida, I'm gonna come over to you just to sort of hear your thoughts on this. Thank you, Arnesa. And let me also start by, by reiterating, um, you know, what, what Riada said in the beginning, how much I'm in awe of what remembering Srebrenica has done over the last few years uh, and how incredibly important this work is. Uh, you know, there's there's always a tendency, uh, you know, and there's even, as we all know, Bosnia is very complex. Um, Srebrenica was not always at the forefront of even politics within Bosnia. Um, it, it really took the work primarily of mothers of Srebrenica and other activists uh, to, to kind of recognize uh, not, not what, what happened in Srebrenica, but how indicative Srebrenica is of everything else that happened in the rest of Bosnia also. Um, and I think that that, uh, you know, so, so, so Srebrenica now acts as, as really kind of a lightning rod for a number of conversations, and that makes the work of remembering Srebrenica even, even more important. Um, and I also want to say that it just, it's just an amazing pleasure to be with three such accomplished women. And it makes me think of all the women in Bosnia who I'm so proud of, and, and you know, who Anyway, my, my life is very difficult without my girlfriends who are back home. And so this just kind of, um, I'm very emotional about being with you. Um, I want to continue what um, Riada said in this wonderful introduction, because it gives me kind of an opportunity to build upon what, 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 what she said. Um, I think the first uh, issue, which is really important always to remember in every conversation about genocide, is this systematic nature of the of the of, of violence, uh, that this is not kind of, it's not random shooting, it's not random violence. Um, it's not, um, it's not violence that's gotten out of hand. Um, and so it's, it's, it's the it's the premeditated um, violence which is based on some characteristics of the group that needs to be extinguished which make it distinct from all of these other forms of violence the other thing which i want to mention is that when we speak about uh, gender and women um and riada also just mentioned that is that i think we really need to understand that in speaking about gender we are talking about more than just about women um, so what we are talking about really is about the differentiated effects that this violence has on men and women, um, on children, on LGBTQ populations. So we, we are speaking here about different hierarchies and different categories uh, of victimization as well, um, different ways in which victims are being recognized or not recognized. Um, and that kind of seeps then and works from the conflict into the post-conflict area it, the times as well. So it's not it's not just the violence which happens at one point in time. It's really the long-lasting effects and the ways in which that violence reverberates through the post-conflict period uh, that that is really so significant. So in, in the in the in the context of in the Bosnian context, if we think about it, we can then talk about you know, hundreds of thousands, and we literally speak about hundreds of thousands of men who participated in the war in one way or the other, not only being victimized by the war, but participated in that war, um, who then were decommissioned, came back into, you know, some supposed normal life where they could no longer find themselves. Um, and we have also thousands of women who might have been victimized, brutally raped, 
but who became really survivors and breadwinners after the war. So they're the ones who are holding the households together. They're the ones who are very often breadwinners in families. Um, they were the ones who managed to maintain family ties, who are kind of the links between diaspora and, and homeland. So we are not, so it's that victimhood um, has in Bosnian case been translated into uh, a tremendously important role for women in sustaining the society, uh, but also in a role which is very often uh, very invisible. So, so the, the kind of there's a there's a dynamic here, uh, which I think um, is 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 crucial for understanding of the gender roles in the aftermath of the of the war. Um, I would. Um, I, I wish, you know, and, and probably kind of the, the other aspect that I wanted to mention is this kind of the global, the global violence, the globally gendered politics and political economy of violence, as my colleague Jackie True usually writes about. Um, and, um, and, and something that I have recently written, which is, you know, that in, again, in the gendered analysis of conflict and post-conflict wars and supposed quote, quote unquote peace, um, we really should be following the bodies, these gendered and racialized bodies that cross that cross borders and travel, you know, with the injuries um, around the world. Um, there is a tremendous degree of attention um, in our region, uh, for instance, to pipelines and and various forms of extractivist economy, um, and there is much less focus on these flows of victimized and and surviving bodies. Um, through the regions which are actually kind of constituting the invisible, again, informal um, economy, um, life, um, and, and reproduction uh, that's completely neglected in our, in our conversations. Um, so that would be, this would be kind of my opening remarks. I would love to hear now what Amra has to say, um, and then we'll, we'll return to some of these themes. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much for that uh, enlightening introduction, Aida, um, and for all your extremely kind words about the work that we do here. It's always lovely to, to hear the, the impact that we're actually having. I think it's people. really recognized. So that, <laughs> you know, not easy to know in this, in this time of pandemic, but it really is. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, over to Amra, who I'm sure will have a very interesting perspective. Um, she is someone, you know, who is, is still in Bosnia and has been in Bosnia and has really done a lot of that post sort of conflict uh, work with, uh, with the survivors of the war and genocide. So Amra, please um, let us know your thoughts. I would like also to say that I'm so happy that... Uh, um, uh, can you see me? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, that, that four of us are actually discussing now because um, as you are feeling, Aida, that you miss your girlfriends in Bosnia, that's why I'm so delighted to see all of you all around the world uh, being our voice, actually, and, and, and I'm so proud knowing that you are presenting us. And so it's, it's really like already huge impact of, of, of remembering Srebrenica. I would say so as a peace activist and somebody who is working these days i would like to say to answer that question in my opinion what we are missing i think first of all that we miss to show the world how it is how it is to be in society which had a genocide so uh, uh, let's start to, to, to speak we we just open up this conversation four of us about the present situation that we don't have any vaccination on COVID, for example, at the moment, that uh, we are we are a nation with the, with the highest number of people dying of Corona, actually, very young people, and 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 uh, uh, especially my generation in 50s who are considered as the young people in the West. But uh, uh, here, all of us who survived, for example, I've survived the siege of Sarajev or others who, who survived some terrible things. 50s are already time when when your body is showing you all results of all that what happened. So. Uh, um, I think it's very important for all uh, people to understand that that how actually society 
suffer even 25 years mm -hmm. after the genocide? And what are the result of this lethargy of depression of, of a, a disorientation, which is all around us? You know, we have like even very close in the region like Serbia or Croatian, uh, people are coming and telling like, but we are fighting. Why don't you fight? You know, why don't you uh, go against these politicians again, this and that? And, uh, uh, and then everybody forget in that moment that we are people who suffered so much and that we are so tired and that we are really full of all these horrible things and, and what happened that it's really hard to, to be a, a strong, to believe in something better, to have a hope, you know. It, it's such a hopeless all around this here in Bosnia. And it's, it's really important to explain uh, 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 to people for future generation, how it is horrible to, to, uh, um, to have genocide in your history. From the other side also, I, I would like to say from this gender perspective that I think that we miss seriously speaking about that really what happened now with those women, what happened with the children, the result of, of, mm -hmm. of the uh, of the rape. I think that uh, uh, maybe sometimes they don't want to be seen because of all this patriarchal environment all around us, but we can have that these stories you anonymously. We can show all the time, look what that happened, what, what had happened with a body, with a health, with a uh, 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 thyroid, you know, with a diabetes. We don't have, we have number of diabetes and thyroid in, in, in that population, in all of our population with enormous, you know, numbers. And, and I think it's important uh, uh, to underline that what happened with, with those people. And uh, uh, also, I think that, that it's important to say good stories, you know, like uh, mm -hmm. uh, who are the heroes of all these stories on the other side that we miss like to, to, to explain like, like a wonderful girl I'm working with who was born on the 11th of September, on the 11th of July in Srebrenica on that day when actually genocide started, she was born in that hall. Uh, 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 her mom delivered her, she lost her father on that day and uh, uh, um, her mother passed away seven years ago because of sadness, you know, and, and, and that horrible things would happen to her. And she grew up in the SOS village where I happen to work right now. And uh, when, I, uh, when I asked my colleagues how I could help her, they said, you know, she maybe can help you. And I'm like, what? She said, she's such a smart oriented, uh, great young woman, you know, she graduated medical faculty. She's a doctor now, she has her own flat. She's living alone, she's strong. She's going on all kind of uh, activism conferences, everything, speaking about all that, what happened. She's such an important, uh, uh, you know, a, a pillar of our society. So, uh, uh, or about our father, Orlovic, the, the woman who is mm -hmm. fighting uh, 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 against the church, she was, which was built in her garden without permission and for, by force. And she's still fighting for that. And she's still alive, you know, trying to have a, a legally moved that building from her garden and having her property again. We had have a, such a heroes, which I think uh, uh, we should promote more. We should speak about them in parallel. Speaking about that, how how it is uh, uh, um, how it is uh, uh, hard to heal society which passed through genocide. Yeah. Wow. That's <clears throat> excellent uh, uh, words on that. And uh, I, with the fact that you mentioned, obviously, these heroes of ours, uh, it's something that, you know, has been really close to my heart because when I left uh, Bosnia and I moved to the United States, um, you know, there would always be Women's History Months, and I would always see all of these amazing American women being celebrated, as they rightly should, you know, for making all these strides. Um, and I think I was about, you know, 17, had just come, you know, from Bosnia, speaking broken English, and I had tried to do a presentation on Bosnian women, and I realized that I knew very little about, historically, women who have been you know, who have uh, brought something and, and did something for Bosnia or made some, you know, huge contribution. And even contemporary 
Um, I knew that the mothers of Srebrenica existed. I didn't know the extent of the work that they were doing. I knew that there were women in in Bosnia who were, you know, fighting against patriarchy, against ethno-nationalism, against fascism, against hatred in every single form. But I didn't know their names. Um, so I think it's really, really important for us to name these people, name people like Fata Orlovic, like Hatija Mehmedovic, may she rest in peace, um, uh, Nusreta Sivac, Bakira Hasacic, you know, these are really heroes. These are women who have, who I personally believe that without the work that they set out, without the work that they put in, we wouldn't be nowhere near this level of conversation on the genocide in Srebrenica and throughout Bosnia. We would just, we would, I, I think we would be at zero, <laughs> honestly. Um, so kind of picking off of that, um, let's, you know, how have Bosnian women fared really since the end of the war? Has there been any sort of progress in equality and equal rights, in uplifting of their rights, in sort of making them these, you know, really important members of our society? I do mean more than just, you know, upholding the mothers and the sisters, but really women as women. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with Aida, because I know international relations obviously is, is a focus of yours. And I wanted to see if you could make any comparisons for, for us as well. Well, Riada has also written about this. So I, I hope she will chime in soon and say, um, you know, kind of this, this wonderful observations that he has, she has already made about the women in Bosnia. But I think, you know, building up once again of, of what we had already said, there is this tremendous paradox in which um, women and women's sacrifices during the war and women's activism after the war uh, have been incredibly important in framing the narrative of what has happened in, in Bosnia. Uh, but that was not coupled with any kind of recognition, particularly within Bosnia itself, um, of those tremendous sacrifices and of that tremendous activism. And I think that we can, uh, you know, on, on the, in terms of legal framework and in terms of kind of paper rights, um, they are all established, but they are often very, they're not basically put into practice. Uh, women who try to enter politics are very often exposed to bullying. Uh, women um, shy away from even entering into political life. Um, and those who do enter uh, really have to do that by ethnifying themselves. It's very difficult to, to do it in a way which would foreground the gender as opposed to the ethnicity in the context that we have at the moment um, in Bosnia. Um, and but there's also the other, the other, this other side of kind of the invisibilization, I think, of women in principle in, in the Bosnian life. And some of it is due to the enormous work, and I really want to keep on highlighting that, the enormous work that women are doing in keeping Bosnia, um, you know, together and or sustaining life and livelihood in, in Bosnia. Um, you know, in a, in a number of... Uh, some of the statistics would tell us that yes, for instance, very the women depending on their income, uh, you know, uh, women who are in the in the kind of professional categories would have an almost parity in employment with men. Uh, women who come from rural areas of poor backgrounds are much more likely to be um, unemployed than men. Uh, but that does not mean that they're not working. That very often means that they're doing, you know, care work for extended families um, that's, once again, completely, completely invisible. Um, and so, frankly, I think women are working so hard in Bosnia that they very often cannot afford to be visible. They cannot afford to enter into politics because they have so many other things that they need to, that they need to do. Um, and, uh, and, and in that respect, kind of the structure has not allowed them to do that because the structure, once again, keeps on um, privileging ethnic politics over all other forms of politics. Uh, but then also the economic structure has really not emphasized any of these aspects of the socioeconomic justice that women could benefit from. Um, so they're so disadvantaged to start with uh, 
um, you know, that 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 they're that making them visible or making themselves visible would just be an extra work for which they frankly have no time. Um, and uh, and so I don't I want to I want to make sure that we understand that this is not like I, I really do think that women are doing so much in Bosnia. Uh, the question is, how do we change the structures to make that work recognized and visible? Well, yeah, and to chip in and continue on what um, Aida has said. Well, I mean, first, specifically, if we know about the political system and the way that it uh, um, exists after Dayton Peace Accords, of course, uh, it suits all nationalist elites to keep the ethnic tensions alive, but in such a volatile environment, and it truly is volatile. And uh, to continue on what Amra has also said uh, minutes ago, I think that it is incredibly important to keep emphasizing that, uh, you know, there are uh, geographic contexts where, fortunately, it's the atrocity is finished, done. So we can really deal with it. Here in Bosnia, we are dealing with genocide denial and triumphalism mm -hmm. with constant re-traumatization, with constant a new dehumanization mm -hmm. of uh, survivors, male and, you know, men and women, but if we're specifically talking about women as well. So whatever we do in the difficult political system uh, with the way that ethno-nationalist elites have entrenched their power and it suits them, in this context, it is so extra difficult beyond the exhaustion that Amra has mentioned again. And that is so crucial to keep just talking to people who might not, you know, understand uh, the, the the impact of it, and hence, in such a volatile environment, it's not easy to find much of an audience interested in discussing gender issues or the particular problems that women women have faced uh, after the war as well. So, which is sad and disgraceful, considering to what what they have gone through. Um, and um, Amra has, uh, pardon, Aida has mentioned certain transformations that and changes that women have gone through. And a lot has been written on it in terms of the changes that actually had to happen. First, because of disproportionate death, uh, imprisonment of men, massive displacement of people. Um, women were left to be the breadwinners besides being the caretakers, you know, and they had to sometimes in, in, in so many contexts where uh, we speak about the resilience of women. And I always celebrate that resilience, but I never shy away from saying what is behind it, that that does not happen easily if it happens at all, that that, you know, the organization that we celebrate in terms of uh, mothers of Srebrenica, et cetera, a system of that grassroots level, that happened because it had to happen as well, um, which is extra sad and extra admirable, if I can put it that way. And uh, that woman's participation in grassroots organizations did change a little bit kind of the idea of who can be a legitimate uh, leader in our patriarchal public scene in a way, if we speak about uh, the authority of mothers of Srebrenica in a particular way. But this is something that's not specific just to Bosnia. Um, well, I have seen it elsewhere in terms of the transformations that um, Jewish women have gone through in terms of assuming leadership positions mm -hmm. after Holocaust mm -hmm. from all that I have read. And that they have been always disenfranchised before, but in the Holocaust, there was no room for this disenfranchised as well. So, um, and, and we do, I think Aida knows Mary Berry wrote about mm -hmm. uh, this in terms of the transformations that women in different geographical contexts go through in terms of El Salvador or Sri Lanka, etc. But what I think is important that Amra also mentioned a little bit and that we need to talk about specifically in the context of Bosnia and Herzegovina, but also in Kosovo as well, when we speak about sexual violence, that's the st stigma and the shame um, that, that really does not allow these women to be heard. And I want to uh, share something that's stuck with me. It's a quote that's that I got from a book related to Rwanda and, and you know, like uh, women's experiences there, but I thought it was very pertinent where they said that it, it was a book called From Surviving to Living uh, Voice Trauma and Witness in Rwandan Women's Writing, but it's very adequate because it said what emerges from the book is that the contentious question of trauma's unspeakability so celebrated in Western trauma studies um, is less significant in the Rwandan context where survivors do not find their experiences unsayable, but rather unhearable. 
this is what I want to mention. Okay. So we have something that we know is unspeakably painful, but what are the contexts and how can we create contexts where this thing is not just unsayable, but rather than also being unhearable, we truly listen. We truly listen without stigmatizing, without shaming, because some, I mean, justice also means different people and the way that people deal with traumas, as all of you know, is so different. Some people feel better when they speak. Some people feel better when they don't speak. Some people need time to speak. And I think that this unspeakability versus unsayable and what is unhearable is something that really stuck with me in terms of at least uh, my individual potential actions and what I can advocate for so we can keep making spaces for discourses of, of, of these um, uh, survivors or some of them. You know, there's also the, the, the question of, is it the narrative of survivor or the victim? Some prefer to be called victim to get the rights that they often can't even get in terms of, you know, rights in terms of civil um, victim of the war to get any sort of pension as minimal as it is. So it is so multifaceted. It is so complicated. But I think that um, with with leaders that we do have. I want to mention, for example, Aina Yusich, that um, all of you might be familiar with, who invests time and effort with her association to fight um, for more positive and fair future for all children who were born as a result of rape and sexual violence. And we call them the invisible children of war, war's forgotten children, because you know, they're around, but do we, how much are we aware of it? How much do they feel comfortable? How much do they feel part of, of a community? So um, that is, it's, it's um, to not repeat what Aida has said in terms of the difficulty of the situation in Bosnia, in terms of statistics, um, the um, continuation of patriarchal norms, of course, that, that, that really just impact everything. Um, and, how much the cultural shift continues uh, and the change of mindset continues being necessary. Um, I think that by having these conversations, by um, allowing more space for all sorts of different narratives, we can both advocate for empathy, but then compassion, which should provoke action, and that open up spaces uh, that, that will work on changing this. And I think that ultimately that political aspect is so important, unfortunately, for uh, women getting more power, uh, more decisions, if we're talking about making some progress, or for just being seen as legitimate um, leaders within their communities. So it's a, it's not something that Bosnia only deals with, uh, which may be a sign of, I mean, uh, something to kind of feel better about. Uh, it's not just us, but we do have a lot of uh, specific difficulties that we continue dealing with, including yesterday. Was it yesterday? The secession, the new secession talks uh, as well. This is not normal. This is not normal. And whether something happens out of it or not, it impacts everybody on top of coronavirus, as Amra said, and everything else that women continuously do. So that is important to um, keep keep talking about. Yeah, and I think just to just to add to that before I hand it over to Amra, because I have a very specific question for her, actually, given her work and background. Um, Amra and Aida and Riada, all of you mentioned that sort of exhaustion that, uh, you know, the women of Bosnia are, are dealing with. And obviously there is the, the exhaustion from the genocide, from the war and having to rebuild their lives start over, take care of their families, take care of often elderly and ill parents, um, as well as having that very little time to actually mourn themselves because there isn't time for grief. There isn't time for mourning. You know, it's, it's all about survival and making sure that whoever did survive that war and genocide was having some sort of semblance of a relatively normal life, obviously, particularly, you know, I'm talking about mothers who looked after their children, especially, and tried to really make things as, I guess, easy as possible for them. And I've heard, this is something I've heard a lot from um, young Srebrenica survivors in particular, um, who have lost their, you know, either 
their father or sometimes even both of their parents. Um, it has been either the grandmother or the mother who has really had to try and make things as simple and as normal for them as possible so that they wouldn't feel that pain and that grief of the genocide. And now I'm sort of ranting and going on, but really what my point is, beyond that, there was never really the space for the women of Bosnia to mourn and grieve properly. And as you all mentioned, we have genocide denialism, we have genocide triumphalism, we have the constant, constant ethno-nationalism in the media, in politics, and the talks of secession. So what I wanted to sort of have Amra really addressed as somebody who is, you know, in Bosnia right now, has been there for, you know, her, her entire life. How, how are the women faring now? How is there, from your perspective and the work that you've done, do you think that there has been, I guess, reckoning with the experiences of the war and genocide by by female survivors in Bosnia? Well, I think that you are unfortunately right that there was no such a time for such a kind of recognition, mourning, taking time for, for ourselves, that, that something like, um, I mean, we, we, we have to be aware that Bosnian society uh, passed through the transition to democracy in past 25 years and women uh, were carrying that democracy processes. Uh, in all part of society, especially in civil society, but also in an educational system, uh, the, the only teachers you will face who are, you know, like using new uh, interactive or other methods in work are women, actually, you know, and, and, and uh, women were making all kind of uh, um, uh, social changes uh, towards democracy, toward participation, toward citizenship. And uh, uh, males were very weak in that process. First of all, they were, as you know, traumatized and they were like uh, um, sick or or simply they were too patriarchal to believe that that really like power should be shared on the top or, or anywhere in society. So uh, um, the, I think that the, those one who are not uh, tired of, of the of the of the war and who who managed to uh, um, be healed uh, from the all these war wounds are uh, have now new exhaust exhaust being exhausted you know trying to uh, uh, make this society uh, uh, democratic make open free equal you know all these things which are coming to the best tradition of feminism trying to do to really uh, bring something what is uh, positive in this changing and and we are trying we are there are a lot of women who are working on that hardly for for 25 years and we always has this political part sphere of society which just make like in one move back uh, 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 for us in what we work for example two or three years uh, something whatever it is you know some new legal and uh, 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 some new law or you know something what is good what is fresh uh, I think that positive things are that we now have these girls like Irma in Mostar or Ivana in Sarajevo just recently and uh, some women who are co not coming from ethno-nationalist background and being in politics and trying to be something, you know, kind of uh, uh, um, new, fresh voices. But I, I, I hear really whatever they say and do. It's really, we're really like under attack of the of the uh, 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 patriarchal environment. It's always mentioned if they are pregnant or if you know if they are not married or whatever. You know, they are they are suffering um, terribly. Um, it's really hard for me to say like. Uh, uh, what happened during these 25 years. First of all, I think that we had very good tradition before the war. I mean, socialism, uh, uh, I, I think that we women were actually more equal than now in, 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 in uh, contemporary Bosnia-Herzegovina. So I don't think that, you know, uh, um, war happened because of that, in, 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 that case, in that sense, I would say. I think that we 
uh, uh, with socialism, we had a lot of good things for women. And uh, after the war in, in democratization process, we, we have a problem of religiosity, for example, which are sometimes uh, for me in very wrong way, interpreted in very patriarchal way, you know, we have a, 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 a traditionalist, it, it, the society become very traditional. Uh, we have, of course, this migration of, of population, like three of you are living now abroad, and we have here a plenty of women who came from the rural area and who have different, you know, like, way of thinking about that, uh, or what is the role of the woman in society. And uh, um, so I think that th there are so many things that it's really hard to say in general, how women, you know, handle and, and uh, what is the situation now. What I can say that I so much relate to this, what Aida said, that we are so uh, busy that we cannot be so much uh, loud about this, what we do. And so uh, very often I, I have uh, people telling me, why don't you say that loudly what you say, what you do about peace building, about connection of peace building with my faith, with Islam and things like that. Why don't you show that public? And I say like, I, I'm doing so, so much that I, it's really hard to think about that all the time, to share that on Facebook, to put that on Instagram, you know, and, 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 uh, um, so thank you for these chances to share that and to say that and and women are really doing excellent job here in Bosnia and Herzegovina and they are really the, the the motor of this society and um i think that that um it is just important to help them to support them to be their voice whenever it is possible and uh, um and also inside so now someone internal thing i think is important uh, that we support our women. We have now problem of this, just as Aida said, ethno-nationalized or politician or even civil, civil society or any, any kind of influencers and public uh, women who, who are um, taking, taking much more of this, I, I would say, male energy and male approach or corporate very much approach to the uh, to other women you know so they are not supportive they are not uh, they are very very competitive they are not thinking about the the, the weak uh, uh, points of the of the of the history of the women who are around us you know so they are not really giving them hands and trying to 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 take them the they go also out and they say publicly what happened to them to support them generally so uh, um this is also think i think what, what what we miss and and i always speak about that how actually we women can help women much more and not be the bone stone of the patriarchal society which is very often unfortunately true so i i think that uh, uh, um we are fine we will manage i hope if this corona don't kill us <laughs> and, uh, uh, if, if eventually something happened but i i'm thankful really for each initiative to support a bosnian woman excellent thank you so much for that and um i i know aida is going to chime in but i i before she does i just wanted to say so much of what you actually stated about the struggles that are facing women in bosnia particularly now with this covid pandemic are pretty much, you know, unfortunately, toe to toe, kind of the issues that are facing women within the United Kingdom, mm -hmm. we are, you know, we are constantly seeing new articles and new research kind of pointing to um, the unfortunate issues that are happening to women at home, whether it's you know, in the UK, unfortunately, there's a huge rise of domestic violence since the pandemic. Um, we we just this past week have seen the, the the disappearance and possibly the death of a young woman in London, which has really shaken up the 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 women in my my own neighborhood in my area. Um, and then obviously a lot of research and and sort of uh, conversations about the sort of general gender imbalance of women as being you know working uh, working moms trying to take care of the family and trying to do their jobs, trying to sort of educate their kids all while dealing with the constraints of the pandemic and having to do it all from home. So it's quite interesting that, you know, even though the, the situations are different, obviously we're talking about Bosnia, we're talking about a country that has had to go through genocide and war and is really trying to rebuild. There are still those general dynamics that are quite parallel 
that are still happening within the UK, within the United States. Um, for example, you know, at Remembering Srebrenica, one of our goals really is to teach about the consequences of hatred, you know, and um, hatred of women and how that hatred impacts them, I feel like is certainly something that is very little um, discussed. So thank you so much for, for that. And I just wanted to chime in with those parallels. And I'm going to hand it back to Aida. Thank you. I just, I just, they were, I just had several unrelated thoughts. So please forgive me if I'm rambling. But um, Amra just made me think about a couple of things, and 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 so did Riada. Um, one thing that I was thinking about this morning, you know, kind of preparing mentally for for our conversation, was um, how easily we forget um, that the, this contemporary genocide denial in Bosnia is also very much related to the to the incredible delay in the arrest and the persecution of war crimes um, after the war. And, and, and then also to this kind of, to the exhaustion of women, how much energy women of Bosnia had to spend on actually kind of trying to argue for those arrests and for that persecution of the war crimes. Um, and so that, you know, decades of Bosnian life and kind of the organization of politics in Bosnia were actually kind of in, instead of rebuilding after peace, were wasted on that, wasted, uh, because they had to be wasted. And the logical consequence of these delays are now the current, you know, kind of namings of dorms after war criminals and the, and the genocide and all. That has not, that just basically has not stopped. Um, and, um, and so, you know, I, I was, once again, I was thinking this morning and I realized we have already forgotten that those decades were lost in trying, in waiting for Karadzic and Mladic to be, to be just arrested, uh, not to mention, you know, kind of brought to trial. And the number of other, other perpetrators who are still walking around and, you know, and you have to deal with them in your own, in your own environment. Um, the second thing which crossed my mind was also something that we don't talk about enough, I think, um, and we probably, those of us who have the luxury of being able to talk about it, should be talking more about it, is also the role of media in Bosnia, but also in the region more broadly. The kind of representations of women that are being fostered through the media and the kind of voices that media actually kind of encourage in, in the conversation and how rarely in that sense we hear, you know, Amras or Irmas or, you know, women who actually can bring change or Fatas or women who are, who should be really um, these, the narrators in the media as opposed to, um, you know, whatever is the next kind of pretty face that's, 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 that, that's celebrated. Um, and um, and so in that really in you know in that respect I think once again um, I'm so grateful for this conversation because I'm thinking that there's a lot that again those of us who have the luxury of doing it have to really help in amplify women's voices from 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 Bosnia um, that that this is a it's crucial in creating that potentially some kind of a you know. Um, kind of a boomerang effect so that someone that can come back. Um, and open more spaces in 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 Bosnia itself, uh, precisely because again, women in Bosnia may be doing already too much uh, and may not have the may not have the time for that. Um, and then the final thing, you know, kind of related to this COVID, yes, I think we are living in you know the crisis. The, the COVID seemed initially it seemed like wow, this is going to be women's moment. You know, uh, this is exactly the kind of crisis which makes it obvious why healthcare is so important. This is exactly the kind of time which makes it obvious why care is so important. Why women as essential workers are critical to the sustenance of societies, not you know, all over the world. And it somehow turned into the exact opposite. Um, it just turns into a situation where women are the majority of the unemployed that particularly in the United States and the UK, it's particularly women of color um, and immigrant women who are basically being further marginalized by the by the crisis. Um, I think in Bosnia, given this catastrophic healthcare situation, women are once again just put into the position of carrying even more um, of that work in, in homes. Um, and so I'm very worried about the backlash. Uh, I'm tremendously worried about violence and domestic violence on the increase uh, that, that we will come out of this crisis not empowered, um, 
I, I'm reluctant to use that word, but to, you know, to make it kind of easier for everybody to understand what we are talking about. Instead of being empowered, I'm afraid that women will come out actually severely bruised uh, by, by this entire experience. Um, and again, all over the world. Um, I'll just chip in again, probably a little bit of unrelated thoughts or are related, but <laughs> scattered as well from what I could have picked, picked up and remember. Um, one thing that um, Arnesa knows, we spoke about it in one of the previous um, encounters, but I think the different audiences need to hear it because sometimes people might also get different perceptions um, related to when Aida says we need to uh, speak out more and those uh, who those of us who have the access, etc. I just want to let everybody know that it is so difficult to get an editor from some international Western media to accept a pitch on an article related to Bosnia and Herzegovina. It is, you, you can, it, it is because it's done deal for so many of them because the world has moved on because there is so much tragedy that keeps on going and they don't feel our pain, which is constant or real or very, you know, palpable with everything that we have mentioned. Um, it is, and I don't want to now get into a completely different uh, conversation of what Ernesta has mentioned on, on her social account in terms of uh, just trust i am telling you from the bottom of my heart and most genuinely and sincerely when you happen to see an article in some international big platform or media all of us need to be cheering up from the bottom of our hearts for whoever that person is that somehow managed to catch the interest or that was able to uh find an angle that is pertinent enough for them to, uh, to, to want to publish it. And this is not our fault. I can't say this is their fault. This is the way that the world works. Uh, but that's why platforms matter. And that's why I always say from everything that I have done, it was the power of editors who understood me or who wanted to listen to me and who had the editorial vision. I'm just now giving you a little bit of how it, how it works, but I think it's important for those who read or for me as, you know, as I see and think to really uh, celebrate everything that does get published and to know that there are a lot of people who are trying. And um, just as, as, as a snippet, it just had happened because of things related to my personal life and administrational, immigrational things that I was not able to work in the United States for years. But I have kept on doing what I could freely because this was something that I really care about. So it is difficult. It is not always linear. It is not that if you happen to be this, this here and there. Just this, this just means we need to celebrate whatever gets done, whatever keeps being out there. We need to uh, remain hopeful. Uh, and as I always say, we need to give each other a chance and we need to understand that a doctor, um, a director, an artist, a, a writer, uh, whoever, whoever is aware enough, thanks to the work of people like uh, Srebrenica Memorial Center institutions, remembering Srebrenica, we have more and more books being published, uh, you know, Hasan Hasanovic or Hasan Nuhanovic, Amra Sabic El Reyes, it goes on in all sorts of, in all sorts of branches. I think that considering the constraints that a lot of academic scholars, artists, etc., are facing uh, for, you know, getting in the international scene to share the stories we're doing an incredible job uh i think that i just want to say that i am incredibly moved and i am i don't know can i say proud but that there is still a lot to do but um i'm very happy and when i see anything because i know how not easy it is so that was just me cheering us all up and just wanting to kind of um 
uh, add that there are people that I want to mention for all those in the audience who might be interested, like Amra Delic, who have dealt a lot and written about trauma, post-traumatic growth. Um, there's an article that came out a couple of months ago, I, I believe, um, on what are the best methods that have been working uh, with particularly women who have gone through sexual violence, experienced it in war. There's a new book that's coming out in June this year that brings together multiple perspectives to examine the strengths and limitations in efforts to promote healing and peace building after war in Bosnia. Uh, it's with a lot of, um, it's edited again by Mary Berry, but it has a lot of um, contributors from the region and the country. So if anybody's interested in learning more about that, um, I, I recommend that as well. So um, I think that was a little bit of my scattered thoughts for now. No, that was that was amazing. Thank you so much. And um, we we do have quite a few questions, and I just want to let you know that you 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 all actually have some brilliant uh, comments and accolades from uh, people who are watching you right now on our Facebook and Twitter. Um, so thank you so much for one being so open and direct in this conversation, because I think when it comes to, you know, particularly Bosnia's women and gender genocide and really the issues that are still facing us, we do have to be quite direct and quite loud and quite specific with, you know, what is uh, necessary. So we don't have a lot of time left, but I know I that you had your right hand raised and I know you wanted to make a comment. Oh, you don't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> No, okay. Um, well, I'm going to uh, not end it here, actually, because we do have quite a few questions, and a couple of them I, I think are, are quite important for us to actually mention. Um, so the, the first one uh, is, how much support are international governments and international organizing giving women to create change? Is it enough? Is it empowering grassroots work, or is it more top-down? And I have a feeling that this question is really directed at Amra. Yeah, I can say that um, everything what we did, we did by support of international community. So I'm the very, very thankful for all people who, who helped with or with their tax paying or by initiating a lot of actions to help us or, you know, governments who were decided to give the money for the projects which a woman wanted to do. Um, Really, I mean, I, I think that that enormous that that uh, um, finally that we had a Hague, you know, and then international tri tribune. It's really a huge thing in in international relations that that you. Know, So much if you ask somebody around do you have some friends in bosnia and like when when we are here to be on an online connection and to learn about uh, our store to, to to hear our stories to uh, um to empathize with us to to teach us to to help us that our children discover some new worlds to to raise our standards you know that we understand that there is something new in the world what we can follow you know all of these kind of of connections are important and i think that that each person can do something if you really want you can find a way you can there are so many organizations who are doing great projects in bosnia and on the web web page they have like the, the 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 part like donate also local organizations a lot of our peace building projects very often we fundraise for 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 some things you can be the one who can who will help on that and uh, I think that uh, um, already this that you are here now to listen to us and that you are just as Riada said interested still in this uh, in this story in in, in Bosnia Herzegovina it's a huge thing for us um, I think that that. Uh, um, uh, we should develop partnerships, we should develop friendships, just unless, as you said, our problems now are very similar, you know, the, the, the Corona crisis show us that's the best thing what could happen, I mean, unfortunately, to us peace builders who are trying to prove that only humanity is important, not uh, ethnic, uh, race, uh, anything, you know, like that. Because when, when somebody is sick and just on today is 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 uh, we could commemorate it's the first day when when the world 
uh, health organization when they pronounce pandemic in all the world. So, I mean, we can agree sometimes on dates which are horrible in society of humanity. We can have a joint things, you know, we can have things in common. And I think that's very important uh, uh, to understand, unfortunately, uh, all this uh, uh, populism and, and uh, uh, right uh, fascism, uh, uh, it's not now reserved for Bosnia, it's spreading all over the world, unfortunately, you know, and I think that that uh, in each country, uh, you will, you will, I think, fight for Bosnia under the quotation mark, if you are uh, voting for the, the democratic and uh, uh, open uh, 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 people who want to help others, who care about gender issues, about humanity, about the, the freedom. I think, you know, you can be, uh, uh, if you are a real citizen in your society, you are helping us too, because uh, uh, unfortunately, I'm sure that war in Bosnia and all these things to happen and this horrible ethno-nationalism, as you know, influenced very much all the world. And, and it's bad things what we did. So. It's also on us in Bosnia that we now spread our good spirit and our goodwill and Bosnian spirit to show that actually it's not us, you know, we are actually the brothers and sisters who happen to have a horrible war, but from the other side, you know, each of you has sometimes fights with your children, with your parents, and, you, and, and it passed, you know, in the same way it can pass and it will pass in Bosnia and Herzegovina. It will be history once upon a time and, and uh, uh, we will recognize that it was just something to pass through this area and, and it will be normal again. And I think that, that only with that hope we can live and survive here. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Amra. Um, Aida and Riada, did you guys want to chime into that question? <laughs> I just want to say what Tamara just said just fills my heart so much. I mean, it's um, it's it, it, it's almost it's very tragic actually that we have come to live um, kind of the Bosnian situ situation elsewhere. Uh, you know, thirty years later, uh, but or Yugoslav situation thirty years later. But on the other hand, there is an element of it which is. Um, liberating in terms of articulating our own voices uh that that the stigma of that war uh which which has for a long time been the one of of, of coming from a place that's cursed where people hate each other where um you know the, the the kind of it's it's a it's a destiny that we cannot escape which is very peculiar to us um, that that it, that has now vanished. I mean, it's obvious it was produced through politics and it can be resolved with a different kind of politics. And that carries to other places um, as well. Um, and and I strangely enough, uh, and this is a little bit the response to what Riada said, it really is, she's completely correct. It's very difficult to get anybody's interest in Bosnia these days because it is, you know, it, yeah, it happened 25 years ago. You should now be happy because it's all over and, you know, move on. Why don't you move on? Um, but also, but at the same time, there was a, there's a lot of recognition now. I think we have come to the point where perhaps our traumas are, are are more tolerable than they than they were. We're we're voicing what we feel and what we think is a little bit easier than it was for a very long time. Um, and I really think, just like Amra said, we have stories to tell. Uh, and it, this is the moment where everyone, both from kind of the quote unquote region and outside, should 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 start speaking out. Uh, we have to. We have and we have to. Yes help each other in that effort. Um, and, and that's my kind of the nicest thing I think that has happened over the last two years is that I have found so many voices that I can identify with. Um, and um, it, it, just, it just helped tremendously in the world, which is otherwise very lonely. Absolutely. And, you know, we live in such an interconnected uh, world, actually. I mean, I have only met uh, Ariada and Aida through social media actually and yet I feel like they're friends of mine old friends that I've you know that I see every once in a while <laughs> so um there is this really beautiful thing about this connection especially between you know those of us in the diaspora 
and back home. I always get excited, obviously, when I meet other Bosnians, especially Bosnian women, no matter where they're at, um, because there is that feeling of, okay, you understand what I've been through. You understand me in a way that other people can't. And I do think that social media has really played such a huge and important role in bringing us closer together, even when we're on the opposite side of the world. Um, I know that there was one more question, and I think both of you actually answered it. You know, how can people support uh, women, Bosnian women in Bosnia, or really anywhere? Um, and I think, you know, Amra said a lot about hope, about supporting each other, about listening to each other. I think what Riata said, especially, rings true. You know, read the stories of Bosnian women, uh, listen to them when they speak, uh, you know, share their work, share their research, their articles, their essays, their art, their poetry, whatever it is. Um, it is important. There is a collective trauma, I think, when it comes to Bosnian women in particular. We had, you know, again, between 20,000 to 50,000 women raped uh, systematically in Bosnia. That is a trauma that has very much trickled down to, I think, girls and women throughout the country and in diaspora. It is not something that we can just completely wash away and forget about. It is something that unfortunately bonds us together in many ways. So uh, to everyone who joined us tonight, thank you so much for listening to us. Be our allies, listen to us, support our work, um, support Bosnian women, uh, support women like the mothers of Srebrenica, uh, you know, uphold and uplift their voices and their stories. I mean, at the end of the way, uh, at the end of the day, the way we combat genocide denialism, uh, genocide uh, triumphalism, ethno-nationalism, gender imbalance, all of these things is ultimately going to be by listening to the victims, by the, listening to the survivors, by allowing them the opportunity to speak their truth um, while the rest of us listen and learn. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Happy International Women's Day and Women's Rights Month. Um, and my deepest, deepest thanks to Aida, Amra, and Riada. It is absolutely an honor to know you and to have had you here tonight. Thank you all.